Today's episode of This Week in Startups is brought to you by SurveyMonkey. Go to try.surveymonkey.com slash twist and sign up for a free trial. And MailChimp, manage lists with up to 2,000 subscribers and send 12,000 emails per month for free with MailChimp. Today on This Week in Startups, Rick Marini is here. He is the CEO and founder of Branch Out. It is a total phenomenon. It's a what, what do you call it even? It's a, it's a job networking thing on Facebook. You hear all about it. We're going to guess the fake startup, and Tyler's going to drop some insights. You're going to learn a lot on this program. Rick has built a $100 million company in social network, with 18th largest site in the world, and then sold it for $100 million. And now he's doing it all over again, and he's doing it bigger and better with Branch Out. You're going to learn a lot. Stick with us. That's what it's all about, man. Hey, shit. Money is the root of all evil. How it feeds my people yeah. We ain't gonna live like equals Until we get the money Spend the money and defeat you yeah. Money is the root of all evil what? Funny how it feeds my people yeah. We ain't gonna live like equals Until we get the money Spend the money and defeat you Hello, everybody, and welcome to This Week in Startups. If it's your first time watching, where the hell have you been? I was about to say. <laughs> We've been doing a hundred... <laughs> Almost, we're, oh yeah, 200 episodes. This program was designed to teach you about entrepreneurship, to teach you about starting companies. This week in startups, and we're all learning together. And every week we have another entrepreneur on, and they tell their story. This week we have a serial entrepreneur who had an exit for $100 million. He's going to explain how he built a $100 million company and sold it. He's going to talk about the exit strategy, his earnout, all the insider details. And then he's going to talk about building his next company inside of the Facebook ecosystem and creating the viral loop, to which he has millions, probably tens of millions of users. We're going to get all those details in just a moment. Uh, Tyler Crowley is my partner in crime on This Week in Startups. He's been with me from the beginning. He's basically like... He's like my Scotty Pippen to my Michael Jordan. He's like, he's my Robin to my Batman. He's my, he's like, uh, what are you, Tyler? You're gonna throw me in the spot like that? You want it on? I can't do these on cue. You can't. You're not like me no. when you just think them up. No, no, no. Well, how are you doing? I'm good. Yeah. Life is good. Yeah. Hmm. I'm excited about the Europe trip coming up. Oh, that's gonna be so great. We're gonna go yeah. to Europe for the uh, Power of One conference. And that's run by Ryan Carson, who was a great guest on the program, you remember. Um, and good show. He does a great job. And it's on... I mean, the show, the, epi- the good episode, episode he was on, episode and, 198 was amazing. And, I, and good... He and he puts, puts on a good, he puts on a good show. So, so I'll be take keynoting, and then yes. are you going to be speaking? I will. This is what's happening, people. Uh, Tyler has become... Tyler's been with me for years. He was like... They're starting, you know. to, they're starting to realize where the real... Exactly. <laughs> the real talent. No, but now they're, they're basically doubling down. They invite yeah. me to speak at a conference, and they're like... We want you to come, but we just want to make sure Tyler can come too. And I'm like, okay. And they're like, yeah, we really want Tyler to speak about uh, how to present your company, stuff like that, because Tyler is the pitch doctor who prepared all the companies for TechCrunch 50, all the companies for launch. And uh, frankly, he does even a better job than me at teaching people how to pitch their company that's, correctly. That's what the companies are saying. The companies are actually saying that. The you've, companies have spoken. The company, <laughs> I, I, listen, it's what you do. You focus on it, and I'm absolutely willing to be right behind you in the ability to to prepare them. I'm re- we, I've just done a whole bunch of the launch conference. Yeah, the tablet, tablet conference. Ones, yeah, and taking it to even a new level. Yeah, yeah. Really, a lot I have of, a whole new I've, process. I've overheard it. I've overheard it. I sit yeah. a couple of desks away. I've heard it. Yeah, yeah. Um, hey, speaking of process, um, if you want to be part of the process of building this program, you can join an email list. It's the back channel. What is the back channel? It's a Google group, essentially, and you pay $2 to $200 a month, whatever you choose to pay. It's up to you how much do you want to support this program. So think about it like college. Think about it like buying books. If you think this is worth $2 a month, fine. If you think it's worth $200 a month, fine. 50 whatever you want to pay. That gets you access to the back channel. Then when you're on the back channel, God, there's 20, 30, 40 great emails a day between entrepreneurs discussing entrepreneurship. I can't invite everybody to that list. So we've narrowed it down to the people who are serious enough to support this program. Go to twistlist.co, pay two, four, 10, whatever you want a month, and join the back channel. And you'll join 170 people who are producing the show. It started just six months ago at zero. We got 170 people on the list. It's going to grow to 500, and then I'm probably going to stop it uh, because you can't really have a meaningful discussion. Get in there. There's three new monthly options Super Fan Fan, Broke Ass Fan, two, 10, five dollars. Hey, uh, am I supposed to do the Survey Monkey ad, the Survey Monkey promotion or the Mailchimp promotion first? Can I get a clarification? 
Because, I mean, I love both of these companies. Okay, I'll do MailChimp first. No, I just saw Survey Monkey back here, and it's like, ee, ee, monkey, chimp. Listen. It's a freaking zoo. It's a zoo in here. <laughs> um, let me tell you, in order to be on the program, I've said this many times, it's a whitelisted partner program. I talk about two companies per program. That's the money that pays the entire staff in this big, beautiful $75,000 studio we've built. And the partners uh, are selected from this whitelist. There's probably about 15, 20 companies on it, and it's sold out for the year. We only had to go about six, seven companies deep before it sold out. Why? Because we only pick great companies. And MailChimp is a company I've been using for years. What do they do? They manage your email list. You cannot be sending bulk email from your Gmail account or on your own service. It's too much work. There's all these things that occur with spam filters, and you need to have somebody who's on it. MailChimp is software as a service. What is software as a service? That means you pay as you go. You pay a little money, you put some credits in, you use the product, you pay, you use the product. No big commitments. A lot of places you go, you know, they want you to sign you up, they want you to sign a two-year commitment or a year-long commitment. Not with MailChimp, they're confident in their service. Cancel at any time. And it's free for people with under 2,000 subscribers, which is probably gonna be half the audience, or two-thirds of the audience. So try uh, MailChimp and connect with your audience. I have over 20,000 people on my mailing list. And what that means is, when I have something new going on, like a, a conference, or I'm gonna be in town somewhere, when I email them, I get an open rate, 30, 40, 50%. How do I know that 50% of people are opening the email? Because MailChimp gives me all those statistics. They track the links, they track the bounces, I can see who's got a higher cloud score, all these amazing, amazing tools, and it's just perfect and flawless. You can tweak the language on the sign-up process as well, which we haven't done yet, but I'm about to do, which means the people in Japan or Germany, and they know which people are signing up from which region, so I, when I'm in Europe, I can just email the European people. You get the idea. MailChimp is the greatest product optimizes ever. Optimizes for mobile and everything. It optimizes for mobile. They've got the iPad app. I mean, one of the things that's interesting about software as a service is when the company gets going, unlike software that you have to download and keep on your desktop and then update constantly, this software's in the cloud, it's on their servers, you just log in, and it's updated all the time with new features, just like Gmail is, or you know, other software products that you're probably familiar with using. Use MailChimp, and they are investing and investing and investing in their product, and you know how much I, they charge they're, you? They're investing in other companies that are building They are, they are funding too. other companies to build apps from. But and the interesting thing about that, you benefit. They don't raise your price based on that, they just constantly wanna make the product better. They're the number one email provider, and you'll love them. I wholly endorse them, and I use them before they even became a partner on the program. Thank you to MailChimp. Now that we've got that over with. Um, Rick Marini, m I met at the DLD conference, I believe it was the first time we met, or that we, we met we've briefly? We had a couple some, interactions before Just that, like but, walking through a conference, yeah. like very briefly. Yeah. Now, you were the founder of Tickle, which was one of the largest sites on the internet at one point. It was a top 20 site. Yeah. Uh, it was one of the first social networks, pre-Facebook being available to everybody. I mean, That's it was right. actually pre-Facebook, period, but it's certainly pre-Facebook being available to the public. You built that up to 200 million registered users, $40 million in annual revenue, sold it for over $100 million to Munster, spent three years there, and then you started a company called Superfan, doing social games uh, and Facebook apps, and you shuttered that to go do um, Branch Out. And I know about Branch Out because when I saw you, I guess it was February in Germany at the DLD mm -hmm. conference, which was a fantastic conference. It was. Um, I was getting clobbered with requests on Facebook to join Branch Out, and I think anybody in the audience has. So why don't we just start with you telling us what is what is the product and why did you build it? Sure. So Branch Out's the largest professional network on Facebook. We allow users to see all their inside connections. Mm -hmm. So you can see not only where all of your friends work, mm -hmm. but also where all their friends work. Ah. So it's really powerful if you're looking for a job, if you are a recruiter, if you're a salesperson trying to get a warm introduction, mm -hmm. or even if you're just a career networker and you want to be able to, um, to have access to all those inside connections, uh, you can leverage your existing network on Facebook and most people have built up, curated these, these friend graphs on Facebook and you can use it in a professional way. So you just type branch out into the search box on face Facebook yep. and go to the app and it's loaded. That's right. And uh, hey, look, here it is, folks. Uh, I'm loading mine right now. And I cannot believe how viral this was. It grew so quickly. When did the product launch and how many members you know, give us some idea of the growth. Sure, yeah. So I had the idea June 1st of last year, so call it 15 months ago or so. Mm -hmm. We built it in about five weeks, because we had already been building Facebook apps and social games on Superfan. So we mm -hmm. had the team already in place. We launched it uh, the first week of July, and uh, we'll call that kind of the, the first beta version, and uh, immediately started to take off, had a lot of great press, um, and uh, ended up getting funded quickly from Excel. Oh, from wow. Kevin Eversey. 
just a Excel, couple of weeks. Excel, of course, the, uh, Jim Breyer invested in Facebook itself. Yeah, and, and actually So Facebook's Kevin, investors invested in Branch House. That's correct. And Kevin actually was the guy who did the deal for Excel oh, for Facebook. Really? Yeah, he was the guy that, that actually put the very, money in. And that was a very, very sought-after deal. Yeah. And Excel was considered perhaps stupid for investing at a billion dollar valuation or whatever it was? They invested at a hundred million dollar valuation. A hundred million? Yeah, but but at that point Facebook was really small and I think their next ah. best offer was around 60 or 70 million. So that was, it was the Peter Thiel round for 10 million I think. Yeah, that was the that first Sean angel money. That Parker set up yep. and it was like maybe 10 million. Yep. And then there was the hundred million dollar Excel round. Yep. That Sequoia and um, Benchmark and Kleiner, all those guys didn't get into. That's right. So Kevin was the guy who invested, and Jim Breyer sits on their board, though. How did he get, how did he get the deal? Do you I mean you know him? From from what I understand, he was he deal. was camped outside of their office, just like just pounding them to, to say, to, you know, we we understand the vision here, we want to be part of this, right. and was relentless and just I mean that's and now what, they own when a VC twenty percent of it. Yeah, yeah, um, and it's funny because Do people yeah. know what is the percentage they own. Uh, I, I don't know what it is oh, now. Okay. Um, they've actually sold a bit. Yeah, um, so I don't know what, as they go. I don't yeah. know what it is today, but uh, it's funny because it was a $100 million valuation, and now Facebook on the secondary markets are trading about $80 billion 80 or billion. so. Yeah, it, was, it peaked at 85 and then yeah. came down a little so bit. So $100 million, $80 billion. It, It's yeah. one of the best VC investments of well, all time. Well, that would be 100x, basically. It would be yeah. worth $100 billion when it goes public, certainly. That's right. So 100x. Yeah, it's pretty incredible. So if they put in a $1 million, they made 100 but if they put in $10 million or $20 million, they made $2 billion. It's in profits. Yeah, it's crazy money. Yeah, it's incredible. Uh, so let's look at the product here for a second. I'm yep. going to pull up my screen, and it says, uh, "Congrats, my profile is 100% complete." All right. See that? I awesome. That you profile. are using Branch. I love it. Yeah. Um, it, I haven't been on in a while, to be honest. That's okay. why I guess I have all the stuff. In, but, but I'm not looking for a job, and mm -hmm. I'm not hiring people. But you're going to sell me on why I should use it to hire people. 485 Branch Out connections. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's a lot or not. How many? So when you scroll over there, how many people does that lead you to over the world? So. Um, oh, when I scroll over, it says 417,000 in my second degree. Good. Is that a lot? That's yeah, that's a lot. Now you're you're you know considered a super connector, so you sure. would have a lot. But so that means your 400 or so Facebook friends lead you to over 400,000 connections well, around the world. I have 5,000 Facebook friends. Right, but of those that are using Branch ah, Out. So 10% of my user, my friends are using Branch Already using Branch Out. Yeah. So you do you have about 10% of the the uh, Facebook? We have so ecosystem? we have we yeah we've got um, we've got some interesting numbers. So we've got millions and millions of active users. Right. Um, we're used in 60 countries. We translate to 15 languages. So it's wow. been a cra it's only been a year, right? right? Just over a year that we've been doing this. So um, so at this point, um, you know, we've got a lot of users. Right. Uh, and here it's asking me, is my company hiring? In fact, we are. Yes. Wow. Look how similar that is. What position, uh, developers? Um, and data description, we want samurai developers who love the son of Santa Monica. <laughs> we will uh, make you a killer. Join us as your first or second job. And share via my wall. Okay, that's got the built-in Facebook thing. Uh, mm -hmm. And there you go, boom. So that's all free. Yeah, um, so that's free. And um, what we do is um, that that went out to your friend network for free. Sure. Companies can go ahead and post to the entire branch out network, mm. and they would pay for that. Got it. So that's their job. Um, they pay $49 a post. Oh, super cheap. cheap. So uh, the immediate connection people are going to make is say, hey, this is very much like LinkedIn. Correct. Um, so how much... What, and we get that a lot. The press sure. likes to call us LinkedIn on Facebook, and and that's um, you know that that's kind of stuck with us from the early days. There's some big big differences between us and LinkedIn, and I think LinkedIn's a great company. Actually, I think they. Well, you spent time at Munster, so you knew the job space. Yes. LinkedIn certainly did the job space better than Munster. You would agree? I, I would absolutely agree. And now you're coming in and saying, hey, you're going to put your own spin on it. That's right. And part of the spin, I think, is what I just got right now, which is these badges and the social yeah. and the fluidness of this. i got to tell you, LinkedIn is very ganky in terms of I, I, they have to really redo their entire interface. They have actually done some interesting updates right now with the feed yep. and with news sharing. LinkedIn Today, I think, is, is interesting. I it's think it, LinkedIn Today, good. which is their news product, I guess, yep. sort of. Yep. However, 
it's still very hard to navigate through mm -hmm. LinkedIn. I mean, it's very archaic. What happens um, is you've got nine years of product uh, built on top of each other, and a yeah. lot of PMs there that, that want to make sure that their product gets, um, you know, gets some visibility. So it, it's, you know, it, it's it's not a knock on them. It's just this happens course, to companies yeah. that have been around for nine years. Right. So I give them a lot of credit. I mean, they they were the pioneers in the space, and um, in a lot of ways, kind of paved the path for us. Um, and Facebook has kind of opened the doors around the world. Mm -hmm. Almost every country, every company right, around the world. Right, you're just riding on their backs. So yeah. Tails. So now for us, we have to execute on the the biggest distribution platform ever created in Facebook. Yeah. LinkedIn has already paved the revenue path. Um, recruiters know they have to pay for these kinds of services. And recruiters pay what, like five thousand a year to have a. So a, with a, LinkedIn, I believe it, I think it's seven or eight thousand per right. seat per year. Right. On LinkedIn. And they have how many people you think doing that? 10,000? Well, LinkedIn's going to do about five. Now that they're public, this, yeah. this data is out there. They're going to do about 500 million of revenue this year. Right. So 250, you think, is And about in 300 the million is in that in, in that product. So 300. And about that. Th 300 million mm -hmm. divided by 7,000 mm -hmm. is somewhere in the neighborhood of 42,000 uh, recruiters paying 7,000 a year. That sounds right. That's an, I didn't know there were that many recruiters in the uh, world. Yeah. But I guess there are. Yeah. No. Oh, HR, HR people. people. Yeah, yeah, yeah HR people. Yeah, and you know, you've got companies that could have 100 recruiters, right? Google probably has 100 internal recruiters. Um, now, unlike LinkedIn, which had to basically fight for every scrap, create the viral loop themselves, mm -hmm. build their platform, you don't have to do any of that. You have that all done for you. Yeah. So we have uh, a huge advantage there. So Facebook is not only the largest social network in the world, you could look at it as the largest talent network ever assembled. Right, and we sure. get and we get to tap into that. So the three things that we love about Facebook um, that kind of differentiates us from LinkedIn would be Facebook scale. Mm -hmm. There's 800 million people on every month, 500 million on every day. Right. Where LinkedIn has about 80 million, I think, a month. Uh, so Facebook's uh, 10x bigger, but on a, on who comes back every day, which is what Facebook cares about. About a million come back to LinkedIn every day versus the 500 million on Facebook. Right. Huge, huge, gotta, huge and, difference. And LinkedIn did not integrate themselves into Facebook. Zero integration of Facebook. Why? They've created their own network, right? So what I say is that LinkedIn owns the pond that they fish in, mm -hmm. and we fish in this giant ocean of Facebook that we right. don't own, right? So I think LinkedIn likes to be kind of a standalone site and be known as kind of the professional network. Right. The reality is professional and personal networking, it's all going to happen on Facebook. It's happening for now. For younger people, yes. For younger, but, but even the older demo. So the average age on Facebook is 38. Did you know that? Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. It's equal in the average age in the world. Yeah. So because everybody has a Facebook page. Yeah. But usage would probably be radically different. If you did it by usage minutes, it would probably be the average age might be twenty five. So our our average age actually of a user is around thirty. Right. Well you're people like serious career people. When you're yeah. young, you're not so serious about it. Yeah. So um, the other things though, that we love yeah. about Facebook, not only the scale, we love the strength of connection. So the strength of connection, it's your true friends and family that right. are that are on Facebook with you, right? Where LinkedIn is, maybe it's someone you met at a conference for five actually, minutes. Actually, yes, everybody. Right? Well, actually, what's really interesting about that here is if you look at the uh, my page, I just logged in. I haven't been logged in for months because um, I don't really use these kind of things. I'm looking mm -hmm. for a job, um, and I tweet when I need to get people, so I'm not really your demo. Uh, but here it says, Tyler joined your network on Branch. Did you just do that? Yep. Okay, so that came up immediately on mine. Mm -hmm. That's pretty impressive. And then here, you may know people in Tyler's network, mm -hmm. but these guys are supposed to, this is, these are my guys. What's going on here, Tyler? <laughs> Roll off and I introduce you to these two guys. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty funny. Um, so I can basically get these guys and invite them, and then I see, I guess, like a feed here, that yep. these are so help-wanted that, that, feed? That's an activity, well, it's not meant to be just help-wanted, but um, there's all sorts of different things. The help-wanted shows you all the jobs in your network that either your friends or your friends are friends are posting. So hopefully there are jobs in there that would be interesting to you and you have the inside connection ah. to be able to get those and jobs. And this is all friends of friends. See, friend of mm -hmm. Hadley Stern, so I know Hadley, so therefore I'm a friend of Eliza Sherman's. Yeah. So the, yeah, the point there is that you can get to any of these jobs through someone you already know. Hmm. Okay, so let's the, do the... Uh, so, hold on, the real interesting thing here though, when you're trying to drill in on like who has the real advantage here because um, you know, when you check out the data on the age of this or that, the real million dollar question becomes as someone gets out of high school and they start doing, kids aren't going to make paper resumes anymore, right? They're going to do it online. Sure. Where are they going to do it first? So I think I think his like, right. So I guess the, awesome little leverage there is that they're going to do it inside of Facebook first before they do it on LinkedIn. Right, and that is the gift and the curse, isn't it? I mean, you're building inside of somebody's ecosystem. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I'm sure every VC meeting. 
they ask you the standard question, yep. what happens when Facebook decides that this is core to their platform yeah. and they decide they want resumes, well, they that, want to do introductions. In. <laughs> um, uh, what, what's your response to them? You're a dumb investor, I'm a killer entrepreneur, you know, I'll deal with it when I get to that point. Or is it, is it a real concern that, hey, you've been tremendously successful uh, Zuckerberg is known for ripping people off and integrating their products directly into it. You told me that before the show. You no, didn't say, I didn't that. say that. I'm joking. <laughs> Everybody's so scared of, of insulting Zuckerberg. Before you, I can understand that you're operating his device. But the truth is, he he ripped off Chorus Q and A, and and he ripped off check-ins from Foursquare. I mean, mm -hmm. he's known deals from Groupon. Deals from Groupon, and then yep. giving up. But I mean, he's known for either to be kind, you know, it's just rapid. Uh, you know, it a rapid copying of people or just blatant ripping people off and, and sticking it in their face because it seemed yep. like with the Cora guys, he was trying to send them a message like, you worked for me right. and I can do this and put it out to the whole platform. And clearly that didn't work. Yep. Is that, what do you, how do you deal with, what, before you answer who that, gets to, who's the host here? No, but there's one other point you're leaving out here, which is, as was discussed earlier on, his main investor is also not only an investor in Facebook, but has a board seat. Oh, that, well, that's a pretty good observation. Okay, so you have this neutral third party, Excel, mm -hmm. yep. who I guess could go to bat for you. But did this come up when Excel was investing in you? Like, hey, there's a liability here. Facebook may uh, go into this business. And did they have to check with Facebook to say, do you mind if we invest in this because it may get competitive? Or did they, they actually did check with Facebook to oh, make really? sure that, yeah, that it was um, it was OK with, you know, if you think about the, the, the difference in valuation, right? You're not going to piss off your two billion dollar, you know, uh, profit. profit. Um, you're going to you're going you're to watch that first, and then um, you know, I, I think the way that Mark's looking, as Mark Zuckerberg is looking at this, is that they've created this incredible platform, mm -hmm. and I think he said at F8, the platform's kind of built. There's 800 right. million people, it'll probably be a billion next year, yeah. and at this point, he wants to see companies that can disrupt multi-billion dollar industries like what we're trying to do come on the platform and um, and and also help transform Facebook from the last three years dominated by social gaming companies, Zynga, Playdom, Playfish, and right. others, to more services. Services right. that have social baked in on day one, because right. that's something that's really important to, to Facebook, leveraging the platform they've built, the friend graph that they've built, and being able to, again, disrupt these big uh, industries by leveraging their Facebook friend graph. Right, so that's what we're doing. So examples of that would be in recruiting, where you get jobs through friends. Dating, you go on dates through friends. Um, travel with friends, you go to concerts. So ticketing is really important mm -hmm. to Facebook as well. Those are the industries that they think can be disruptive, and it wouldn't be in their best interest to go and start to um, to build within those industries because it really hurts the app um, ecosystem. Right, and actually they haven't. I'm trying to think of an example where somebody had a really great app that they sort of nuked and, and took over that space. I guess maybe, what are your five favorite things, a slide thing, they'd sort of neutered that, but Cora was a separate product, it mm -hmm. wasn't like it, and they certainly haven't screwed with Zynga except to maybe take their no. 30%. No, and, and Facebook's not gonna be a social gaming company, right? They're not gonna yeah. go create social games because Zynga got big on their platform. Right. So that's the other thing, so Facebook's are two things. Are you sure of that? I mean, people said that about I, Microsoft with Microsoft Word, they're not gonna make word processes. No, F Facebook is two things. They're a, a platform, mm -hmm. which we talked about, and number two, they're an advertising company, right. right? So we sell our product, our enterprise product, to recruiters and HR professionals right. and sales professionals. Facebook, they're an advertising company. They don't go to HR professionals to sell, right. um, and they build a platform. They don't but build they social games. But they get zero percent of what you sell to these recruiters, right? Uh, currently, yeah. So right now, the thirty percent kind of credits tax is only on social games. We we are we're kind of a different beast than that because we don't sell to a consumer right, right now. We will in the future have some consumer oriented, and that will use credits. That will probably use credits if and we'll, Facebook. We'll, Request we'll, that you use Fred. Yeah, credit. and we'll have that discussion with them. And if they want us to use credits for that, then that would probably make sense. What about sense. the enterprise piece? I mean, what if they come and say, "Hey, you're making a million dollars, or ten million dollars, or a hundred mm -hmm. million dollars on enterprise. We want thirty percent, right. and that's your margin." Right. So, um, so yeah, this is a big week for us. We're going to be launching the first enterprise product oh, ever, you are? On, ever on Facebook. Wow. So that's on um, on Thursday. So we're super excited about that. And what is that product? That. Is that like a LinkedIn kind of recruiter product? Uh, you're going to see some similarities to what LinkedIn has already built and does yeah. 300 million in revenue. Um, a lot of the recruiters have been saying, we want to be able to do this on Facebook, give us that kind yeah. of functionality. LinkedIn's done a good job at it. So sure. 
learn from them. We've got, of course, our own bells and whistles as well. Sure. But give people, give recruiters the ability to, to use that sun, similar functionality on Facebook. Right. So that's launching this week. We haven't had the discussion with Facebook on how they can try to kind of tap into that. I'm sure it's a discussion we'll have in the coming months. Yeah, I'm sure they're going to want to have a piece of that. But I guess the question is, you negotiate it like anything else. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, here, this is an interesting feature. You know, the I'm looking for an introduction. I didn't realize you had this. Yeah. But I just looked at my inbox, and we'll pull up my screen for a second, and we'll see. Oh, there we go. Um, I'm hoping you could introduce me to Kevin Rose. Thank you, Hilo. Uh, and. Uh, this is, uh, I guess, similar to the LinkedIn functionality. Yes, and for an introduction. It and doesn't the, exist in Facebook natively, does it? No, the key thing here... Right, you can't introduce somebody to somebody else in Facebook? No. There's no request and intro. No, you would why just you, you would you would Facebook? send the message to them. Um, I don't know why they haven't done it in Facebook, but for us, this is a very normal thing in business, right? People right, sure. ask you for introductions to people all the time. And what we've tried to do is mimic the real world kind of offline introductions or online through email within branch out. So, you know, you'll act as a gatekeeper, you'll decide whether or not that person should meet Kevin, and you're probably going to be more careful about Kevin um, than some other folks, uh, mm -hmm. because he's kind I of... I get like 20 people a week ask me to introduce them to Mark Cuban, and I just mm -hmm. have a blanket, I don't introduce people to Mark Cuban. Yeah, and, th and that's fine, you'll act as a gatekeeper, yeah. and you'll figure out that maybe there's one out of the 20 that you actually do want to hook up yeah. with Mark. Perhaps. Yeah, <laughs> so, so that, that's actually a really uh, powerful product for us on both the recruiting side and on the sales side. So the original spark that I had for Branch Out was actually a friend of mine asking for an introduction for a sales lead and uh, Facebook didn't make it easy for me to find out where my friends had worked and I forgot yeah. which of my friends had worked at that company he wanted to meet mm. so I asked our head of engineering to build me a widget to show me all of my friends and, and where they worked uh, and that was a genesis a spark of branch out. Ah, interesting. It was, yeah. a, it was actually for sales and then then as, as we started to um, to think through it the LinkedIn on Facebook thing kept coming up and you know that was something that, that was sense fundable. Because even your average recruiter or, or HR person as awesome as LinkedIn is, and I don't think anybody argues that, you're, it's almost like you're seeing the real person on their Facebook profile. Yes. Because yep. the LinkedIn profile is, all, you know, it still has a bit of that resume. Mm -hmm. it did, I think it helps a lot that uh, people don't go crazy on LinkedIn, like with trying to bend the, you know, the reality of what they are, but on Facebook, you're actually getting a much better representation of what the person is well, anyway. It's a, the Facebook is the more complete graph, certainly. And, um, LinkedIn's weird um, unwillingness to embrace the clear winner in social networking for years. I mean, mm -hmm. they've ignored it for years. Yeah, LinkedIn was, so, there, was, there, was there first before Facebook was created. Certainly, LinkedIn and they existed. watched the whole thing occur, and they, I guess they never got to it. Or when you're making $500 million, why would you bother? That's the thing. You know, they, they had a huge IPO. They're worth 8 or $9 billion, whatever the right. market cap is today. They would rather be compared to yeah, Facebook. Right. Do you want to rock the boat and take away your status of, of being one of those big, big networks and just being a part of a network? Right. And for us, it made sense to be part of that network. And that's your leverage. That's your way of getting in there. Uh, and so... Um, when we get back, I want to hear about uh, your interactions with Zuckerberg. Okay. You must speak to him on a regular basis, yes or no? Not Mark on a regular basis, but a lot of other folks at Facebook. Oh, got it. So I want to hear about how you manage that relationship so that our audience can learn, you know, how you deal with a tenuous or dicey dynamic. I don't know what the word is exactly. Sure. But you know, a dynamic company with a dynamic platform and, a, and dynamic relationships with the people building, and it's certainly we saw with Twitter, a lot of fallout when mm -hmm. they decided they were going to maybe dip in and do some of the things that their previous partners were doing, like clients. Right. So when we get back from commercial, we'll do that. Hey, here's something amazing. Remember I told you we had like one slot left on the uh, advertising for the year? SurveyMonkey took it. Again, I've been using SurveyMonkey for two years. You don't believe me? Well, look. Uh, here is a survey. I, here's my here's my screen. Let me pull that up for a second. And as you can see on my screen, um, these are all different surveys I've done over the years. And one of the surveys I did was to Jason's list back in July of last year. And some of you may have taken this one. And I asked people, "What do you want me to write about in my email newsletter?" Right? It's twenty thousand people. That, yeah. And at the time, there were maybe ten thousand people, and nine eleven hundred people, close to twelve hundred people, responded through SurveyMonkey. And I asked them questions like. Uh, how do you like hearing from more vo voices, not just Jason's? And some people, 37% said they did not. So I stopped sending other people stuff because they signed up for Jason's list. What did they like? They liked when I ranted. 84, 79% um, of people liked my rants, and 84% of people liked analysis. And um, let me see. Um, 
where should I, if you're, are you interested in a group to discuss uh, after, you know, like a discussion group? Mm -hmm. And people said they really wanted a Google group or a web-based forum. And you could, just, you could see how easy it was to uh, put this out there. So I just did one right now for um, who would you, which of the following people would you most like to see as a guest on this week in startups, you know, the big names that we haven't had yet. And, oh, let me put my Garrington on it. That's pretty funny. Uh, clever guys. Uh, and so I can just very easily click here to analyze the results. And building surveys in here is so quick. Have you ever used SurveyMonkey? Uh, yeah, we use it. Oh, you use it? Oh, yeah. It's uh, great. It's an amazing product. It and is, it's absolutely. like only it's super cheap. I don't know. What does it cost? Like 100 bucks? They, they have a free thing. much like It's free, Survey right? Yeah, it is free. Uh, so let me take a look at that. You know what's a really my Wait favorite? Wait a second. It's free for 10 questions and 100 responses per survey. That's yeah. more than most people need. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I think somebody put, put up on the screen well, how much it costs. I don't even know. Because I, I, it's such, so cheap, I can't remember. I think it was $17 a month? I. That's so cheap. Uh, anyway, as you can see, um, especially, nine especially people voted for Mark Cuban, nine people yeah. voted for Mike Arrington, so they're neck and neck. Uh, not a lot of people want to see Sean Parker. I'll ask Sean to be on. 75 pe people answered the question. I just tweeted it before. You can create these quizzes, these uh, surveys so, so easy. Designing a survey, I'm pulling up the designer here. It's just like you pick what theme you want. I have a This Weekend theme. I have a Launch theme. I have a Mahalo theme. Uh, and you can edit those themes. That's how it look and feel. And you can put like what the end landing page is, is. And then if you want to add a question, you just click the add question box. And it says, what kind of question? And look at all these different choices. Matrix, only one answer per row, multiple choice, an essay box, a rating scale, numeric. I mean, these guys have, it's software as a service. They've been at work for years building this product. And it is the largest survey product, hands down, and the best, um, and the best, the, the, the most refined one. So if I said, hey, I want to do a multiple choice, only one answer, right? how many, uh, display them as buttons, put in the question text, put in the answer, and you can hear, look at this, here's a really cool little feature, sort and randomize it so you don't have like that first question biased, uh, require an answer to this question, you get the idea. You, I used to go to a developer who I was paying a lot of money to and say, make me this, and they would have to go make it, and you probably did that too. Sure. Now as the CEO, you can make your own survey. Yeah. You probably have. Yeah, it's super simple. I, sometimes I do these kind of surveys. I send them to my employees. How am yeah. I doing? How's this going? And they just, boom, they yeah. fill it out themselves. We use this for user testing. Ah, user testing. Mm -hmm. And $24 a month is so cheap. Yeah. And, and you if you had to have a developer put it on, it would cost you a two more than that. probably $5,000 to just get it up and running for mm -hmm. one quiz. I don't know how many times i got to tell you guys this. When I love a product, I put them on the short list of like 20 companies that are allowed to sponsor the program. SurveyMonkey has been up there from the beginning because I've been using it for years. And I always said, somebody asked Dave Goldberg, I know him for a while, if he wants to uh, sponsor the program or someone. He was like, oh, I love the program. I'll sponsor it. Actually, we have to have him as a guest. A tremendous entrepreneur. Uh, SurveyMonkey is fabulous. You will love it. I guarantee it. You, um, you left out one of the, the best features. What is that? The, the, what they call skip logic. Where I don't even it, know what that means. You have to explain that. It's, it's one of the most intelligent. It's not just this is not just like a dumb survey. If somebody responds to one of the questions, you know, one of the questions is, do you like vanilla, chocolate, or strawberry? And they say strawberry. The rest of the questions change after that because they like strawberry. So it becomes a dynamic. Oh, like a threaded thing. No, Choose it just dynamically answer. changes like, the survey based on their their previous answer. Wait, so if you said, do you like chocolate, strawberry, or vanilla? And I said strawberry, you know I like fruit flavors. So now and then the rest of the survey changes uh, accordingly because now I want to know, oh, if you like strawberry, do you like raspberry? Or it would be more like, what do you, what do you, what do you most look forward to? Breakfast, brunch, lunch, dinner, dessert. Mm -hmm. You're right. And yep. then if they said dessert, what type of dessert? Right. Mm -hmm. Ah, that's the way you sort of yes. explain it better. Yeah. Right. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Um, and they make it as simple as drag and drop. Super simple. Um, well, that's great. Thank you, Survey Monkey. Now, you now got, I got two that, chips. That's why they wanted you. <laughs> they do. They want me for my. <laughs> <laughs> and I need a, so this is the Mailchimp one, but I need one that's a survey. They gotta get a sur get me a Survey Monkey doll in here. Anyway, listen, I am so blessed to have these incredible sponsors and partners who make really great products, and to have them sponsor the program. To you don't have to pay for this program because these people. Uh, support the program, which means you should use their products. If you are loyal to this program and you get one actionable item out of a year of watching this that changes your career, then go sign up for it. Do it as a favor to me. Sign up for SurveyMonkey because you're doing yourself a favor. Rick uses it. I use it. Tyler uses it. Everybody uses SurveyMonkey. It's fantastic. <laughs>
Hey, hey, hey. That's it. Rick's like, what have I got in myself? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I love to sell. I love selling. I love selling You're something good that's at great. It. You know, like I love. It's so easy when it's a great product. Yeah. It's hard when it's a bad product. When it's a great product, it's so easy. True. Okay. So now, when we first left our hero, that's you. You were inside of the Facebook ecosystem. Okay. You had pivoted your gaming company, social gaming. Yep. Why'd you pivot out of social gaming? You saw Mark Pink, it's like, I don't want to compete with that guy? Yeah. Too late? No, well, yeah, I mean, that that's part of it. Mm. Um, but we realized the trajectory we were on was not going to be a big exit. We got profitable, but it didn't feel like it was going to be <clears throat> Zynga or Playdom or Playfish. So when I had the idea for Branch Out, we realized we can be the first mover. I was self-funding my second company, Superfan. Ah. I had guys that had worked for me um, from Tickle, mm -hmm. so I had this long, you know, long relationship with them. I knew it was the right team. We had the right DNA from Tickle, from Monster, yeah. from Superfan, so we pivoted. Ah. So we, we saw a much bigger opportunity. So you gave up the sure thing that you knew would be only this big That's to right. try to go for the big. Yep. You went to where the puck was going. Hey, do you ever think that you sold Tickle too soon? I mean, you sold uh, the 18th largest site, mm -hmm. Social Network, yep. in 2004? Yeah, May of 04. For $100 million, Yep. Right after you sell it, Facebook takes off. Mm -hmm. The social networking space becomes validated. Yep. And if you had continue to grow, maybe you get to the top 10. One of your previous employees left to do Bebo and sold it for 850 million. Yeah. As an entrepreneur, how do you know when it's too early, too late? Uh, did you sell too early, and looking back on hindsight? So it's, it's a really hard question for entrepreneurs to know, mm -hmm. right? When you're in the middle of it, um, you've, got, um, you've got a lot of factors, yeah. not just financial, but human factors. So James and I, when we founded the company in 99, we actually said we either take this company public or we sell it for 100 million. The dream of every entrepreneur is you start a company that you can take public, right? Really, really hard to actually get there. Right. So is we that had, a dream anymore? Um, maybe not with, with all the, the Sarbanes-Oxley and all the Feels changes. It's kind of miserable. Stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, look uh, but, at but it, it's media, typically though the biggest people. exit you're going to have, right? So you want you want to have is that, that. The public markets will typically you know, give you a, it will pay the most. Maybe yeah. not anymore, but the way the market's going, I mean, maybe Microsoft or Google's a better exit. Maybe they'll. Overpay. It could be, yeah, it could be. But for for James and I, we had gone through five hard years. I mean, we started the company in '99, raised money in March of 2000 from our buddies at August Capital, oh, from wow. David Hornick and, and Andrew Anker. So wait, you raised in March of 2000? Yeah. The market collapsed. We in May. raised. Uh, well, no, it was March actually. The Nasdaq tanked the week after we raised our 9 Went million. from 5,100 down to maybe 3,000 in yeah. that month. But then it really started to go down. It went down to 1,500, 2,000 yeah. after 9-11. Yeah. So we raised money. Good timing. We raised money a week before the NASDAQ tanked, okay? If you hadn't raised money, would you have been out of business? Yes. Wow. So raise money when you can is the lesson? Uh, that's often, often a yes. Raise money when you can. Right. I mean, there's a lot of Do you still have those factors. battle scars? Are you still, like, now with Branch Out go... You know what? This could all come crashing down. Sure. Groupon's IPO spirals out of control. Yeah. LinkedIn uh, tanks, or you know, Zynga doesn't get out, and this whole thing comes apart. Absolutely. I need to raise my money now. Yeah, no, absolutely. You think that? I mean, we've raised two rounds. We raised six million from Excel in September, and another eighteen million from Redpoint in April. So we've raised twenty-four million over the last year. Twenty-four million a year. So you definitely are gun shy and conservative. You want to have dry powder. Well, we so we weren't looking to raise a Series B actually for Branch Out, but Best we had we it. had yeah we had so much traction in Q1 mm. as you talked about. You're sure. inundated with with Branch Out um, invites that um, we were in a really good spot where a bunch of VCs came to us. Um, we had about almost 30 VCs come to us in a in a kind of 30 day period, and they also we wanted to do a preemptive B before someone else. Well, they were all saying the same thing. Ah. And we ended up picking five that we thought would be a good partner. And Jeff Yang, the founding partner of Red Point, sure, had done guy. MySpace and Not some other... Not a big other... poker player. No? No. All right, maybe I should play Jeff, with them Jeff then. Jeff Yang paid for my daughter's uh, <laughs> first year of nursery school. Thank uh, you, Jeff. <laughs> I know Jeff is like, mm, Calicatus! I'll so, see you at the D poker game. Bring so, you a checkbook. <laughs> so we liked we liked Redpoint a lot. We liked Jeff. We liked their history. He's great. He's, He's a awesome. tremendous, tremendous. VC. So you know, given that it, it was competitive, you sure. know, it was um, it was a good time for us to raise the money, and we did. So we we locked in the twenty four million. So now we've got a lot of runway there. Um, now, yeah. again, being a battle scarred entrepreneur who went through really the what was a horrific two years. Yep. In terms of for the country and the poor people who died. Back in 2000. 2000 and 2001. 2001. Yeah. I mean, these are two horrific years. Yeah. You now have the dry powder to go for two or three years. 
Yeah, yeah, we do. Um, yeah, we're, we're fortunate that way, and we've got this enterprise product coming out, so we're going to start to crank revenue. But back to your question on when is the right time to sell. Yes. This is a hard question. Yes. Okay, so you've got guys like Mark Cuban who knew exactly when to sell $5.7 billion yep. sale to Yahoo. Well, he had a hundred company. People forget. Everybody likes to say, like, oh, he got so lucky. He had a company that did $25 million, I believe, the quarter it was sold. Okay. So it, it wasn't it was a it wasn't real a, company, but that revenue public. multiple is crazy, right? $100 million, yeah. Yeah, that would be 50 times. Yeah, 50x. I mean, that, that's, that's huge. We, we sold at 4x. We were you doing have to 25 remember, though, million. Yahoo was a $100 billion company at the time, I believe. Yeah, yeah, everything so was inflated. So 5% for what added a lot more than 5%, I think, to the revenue line. So people yeah. have to put it all in context. But yeah. yes, but he But he knew, but he was smart. Okay, and then Mark what, Zuckerberg. Did he, do you think he did know, or do you think he just gets credit for that in hindsight? Five point seven billion billion. Just yeah, lock that in, go buy and, the Mavericks, have a good life. And like, he it's great. collared the stock. Oh, did he really? He collared oh, the stock. Smart. Yeah. So, you know what? When people say Mark Cuban got lucky, I'm like, you know what? He got lucky like three or four different times in a row. Oh, yeah. He got lucky with his first company. Then he got lucky. HDNet. Yeah, well, no, HDNet after he, but he, yeah. then he got lucky to set. His first company was like this micro computers or micro devices or whatever. Right. He sold that for a couple million, got his nest egg. Then he did uh, broadcast Then and sold it. Then he collared the stock, then HDNet, mm -hmm. then the Mavericks, then the championship for the Mavericks. Yeah. I mean, yeah, how many times can he's you, blessed. if a guy gets lucky six times, it's not luck. Oh, I'm not saying he's lucky. What no, I'm saying is he was smart to know when to sell, and Mark Zuckerberg, the other Mark, was smart to know not to sell to Yahoo for a billion dollars and keep going, right? right? And now they're worth 80 billion. So, so how do you know? So, um, so I, I, what I was saying, I think there's financial factors, $5.7 billion for Cuban like so to sell. So you've been but, disproportionately rewarded, which you felt you weren't tickled? Um, well, Tickle was actually a fair offer because Monster was trading at 4x revenue in mm -hmm. the public market. We were doing 25 million of revenue at that point, so they just said we're going to give you the same revenue multiple. But actually, rewinding from rewinding back a prior month, um, Excel, my current investor, was going to fund Tickle back then, yep. back in 04, for 100 million dollar valuation. Okay, huh. and Jim Breyer was going to join our board. Whoa! Okay, holy cow! So yeah. wait a second, you would have been Facebook. No, no, no. I don't think we would have been Facebook. I mean, but I think it would have been. Would they have been able to do the Facebook deal? Because they had Tickle. Then Tickle might have been competitive. They may not have gotten the Facebook I've deal. I've never thought about that. That's funny. Huh. Would have blocked the Facebook deal. Yeah, and, and that, you would have been the guy was, who would have went to Jim Breyer and said, "Hey, what's up, man? You're going to invest in my competitor?" Right. And at that point, Tickle was bigger than Facebook because Facebook was just forming in '04. Wow. Right. I mean, literally, Mark so was. So they would have made Harvard. a mistake. They would have actually. Wow. Yeah. I've never, I've never thought about that. Is about just it that a way. total. Yeah. You know what they call that? There's a term for fiction when you split uh, alternate fiction, which is like, what if the Confederacy won the Civil War? Right, right. And how did it play out? What if yeah. the, what if the Nazis had, won, you know, uh, beaten the, you know, the, the mm -hmm. Allied forces, and they would have, you know, all of Europe would be, would have been German, Nazi yeah. Germany, you know, like yeah. wow. I love that alternative fiction. Yeah. So, so anyway, uh, so back anyway, to so, when you know to sell. Yeah. So so for us, there were some human factors that came into play. Now, Burnout. Now, um, yeah. So James and I had been busting our butts for uh, for five years on Ugh. the company, right? Yeah. And uh, we had we had gone through the recession. That was hard. And James had at that point two young boys, age two and one, and his wife was pregnant with twins. So he was about to have four boys under four. Yeah, so if he owns it, a third so of the was, company, getting 20, 30 million dollars is like, you know what, I need to cash in my chips. Yeah, because- Totally reasonable. Because I think a lot of people forget humans run companies and there's real yeah. human factors that come into play, like I'm burned out, I can cash out. And these were the days before this idea of a founder being able to sell some shares. That's right. There was no option no, for you to had, sell $10 million no. or sell half your holdings or a third of your holdings, yeah, right? No, James and I had never sold a single share up until uh, the Monster acquisition. If you had been able to, if he had been able to liquidate half of his shares, take $10 million off the table and keep the rest free rolling, he probably would have done it. Maybe. That's a maybe. Because we, we were pretty burned out, too. Oh. I mean, we, we were working a lot of hours and... Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, I mean, we were feeling good, and we're definitely yeah. uh, you know, on uh, accelerating. So there, there, was, there were personal factors, I think. Hey, question from Musa in the chat room. If money were no object, would Rick create, what would Rick create for consumers? Well, that's a really interesting question. If, money were, if you had an unlimited R&D budget, what mm -hmm. would you tackle if you weren't doing branch out? I, I guess I'm it. assuming that's what he means. Like, what would you, what would you want to build? 
I, I love what I'm doing right now. Yeah. I, I really do. I, I think an entrepreneur. I, I think we're changing the world right now. Yeah. Um, you know, LinkedIn has done a great job outside of outside of Facebook, and they address a 10% of the global workforce as white collar managerial. Yeah. For us, though, we've we've got the other 90% as mm-hmm. well, not just that 10%, but the Get other the 90%. Folks too. Yeah. So they're Wall Street in a lot of ways. We're Wall Street and Main Street, mm-hmm. right? So because we've got kind of what I would call a noble purpose, and that we're getting people back to work. I mean, I was fortunate to meet the president, President Obama, a couple of weeks ago, and yeah, actually, value, yeah, yeah and, and talk to him about what we're doing. And we're working closely with Anish Chopra. He's a CTO of the United States and getting the military back to work. So I feel like what I'm doing is actually having an impact on the world. What is your take on the massive unemployment? Is it a permanent reset because these manufacturing jobs have left and the people who are 50 years older will not be able to be retrained and they're uh, sadly just not going to be reintegrated mm-hmm. into a high paying $20 an hour, $25 an hour manufacturing job and that's it and we we just have to work our way through that over the next 20 years and maybe those people have to bunk up with or the kids got to take care of them. Uh, What's going on? It, it could so there's a uh, 9% unemployment rate there's 14 million Americans out of work and they're almost all blue collar, right? And so. that 9% is not the real number we all know there's another five or six percent that have given up or are underemployed yeah that, that, that's probably true yeah that's probably true um, well no it's definitively true i mean the nine percent is like the looking and out of work there's like that other part yeah. that's you know they're greeters at target right, right. Or walmart and they don't really want that job yeah so anyway you're saying so um so it's going to take some time to work through this yeah. um there uh the, the the world has changed and a lot of those manufacturing jobs are gone and they're probably not coming back i mean the u.s is increasingly moving towards a service economy right. and a lot of the kind of lower level uh, manufacturing jobs are now in china or somewhere overseas and um for folks that are like over 50 that haven't been in more of a service-oriented yeah. type of role. There's retraining that needs to be done, and for a lot of these people, it may not take. I mean, it's it, it's going to be hard for them now. But but the, the interest- for a fifty. I mean, I have my father, sixty-five, and he ran restaurants and bars yeah. his whole life. That nobody will hire. Him. Right, right. It's tragic. Mm-hmm. He's it's not. He, he's got nothing to worry about in terms of finances. They've got enough saved, mm-hmm. and they got kids who are successful who will take care of them. But it's just crushing for a man to not be able to work the final five or ten years of their career and it's been like he's been underemployed for four or five years and Mm -hmm. he would like to go to work every day and there's nothing for him yeah that's tough it's tough it's probably going to be the key issue of the uh the the next election i think it's jobs and and, that's why people are uh basically protesting and rioting in the streets right If, if the unemployment was less it would they probably wouldn't be out there yeah that's right so what do we do? The manufacturing jobs are gone forever, mm-hmm. and you said it's a service-based economy. We also hear talk of maybe some of these service jobs are leaving too. Accounting going to India, web design, some of the programming going to Eastern Europe, uh, even some South American countries picking up web design work. Mm-hmm. A lot of the knowledge workers, call centers, some of those are leaving the United States. Sure. Um, so we might be losing some service jobs too. Yeah. Well, I think. Are we just not competitive as a country anymore? No, I, I think I think we can still be competitive. I do. Which means that you think that we're not. Um, I think we need that, to hone our skills. I we think need to we be more are aggressive. competitive, but we could do better. Right. I agree. Th- th- with that's you. that's what I think. Um, we need more software engineers. We need more people in healthcare. We've got an aging baby boomer demo that needs healthcare. Right. I mean, there are there are pockets um, of of industries and those two verticals especially healthcare and and tech that we. We need more people. And we don't seem, is it that people don't want to be retrained or that it's just very hard for people to do that? Like to, as a mind shift to go from being like a high paid Wall Street guy, mm-hmm. now I got to be a nurse right, or right. I got to work as an orderly or I got to be a software programmer. I was like a Wall Street guy. I was a day trader or I'm sorry, a desk trader or something like that. And now yeah. at 50, I've got to be retrained to be a software engineer. It's, it's in, like you said before, it may not be possible. Yeah. So I think the ego only goes so far before yeah. you've got to pay your mortgage, you've got to put food on the table, you've yeah. got kids, whatever. Yeah, that might be a one or two or three year kind of ego then. Yeah. Hmm. You're optimistic? Were you yeah. concerned? Um, I think we need changes in the education system to, um, to uh, the long-term health of this company. What's the number one country? thing we can change? If, I would, if you could wave a magic wand and say this was fixed, addition, subtraction, whatever, mm-hmm. what would you change? I would love to see more people going into science and technology, more uh, hmm. more students, and giving them incentives to do that, which could include free education if you come out with a four-year degree in engineering. Why are something. we doing that? That seems so simple. We should be. Absolutely. Why don't we just cut the military 20% and put that towards <laughs> science degrees? That's that's one way to do it. I mean, Why don't we raise the tax on the rich 3% and put it all towards education uh, and engineering degrees? I'm sure if you asked 
anybody in the top 20% of the country, if they'd be willing to pay 2 or 3% more tax to mm -hmm. put it towards science, wouldn't they say yes? Wouldn't you? You're part of the 1%. I wouldn't. I need those software engineers. So, so I you would. would? Yeah. Would you pay 10% more tax? 10% gets tough. Okay, would you pay 5%? Would you pay 5% more tax? Yeah. If, you you if, you if you knew the 5%. Five, let's go 5%, Max. But the whole 5% was going towards education, mm -hmm. retraining, et cetera. Would you pay it as a, as a part of the 1%? If I knew it was going there and it was going to retrain Earmarked. America, yeah, to, to put us back on track where yeah. I think we need to, starting with education. You easily would do it. I would do 5%. No brainer. Yes. Me too. Do you feel guilty as being part of the one percent? And when you see what's going on in the country, what's going on on Wall Street with the protesters, do you feel like maybe the system is so fast and furious that people like us, our industry, you and I, mm -hmm. have been disproportionately rewarded, or have we been appropriately rewarded for the risks we've taken? Um, I'll answer the question after you. Okay. <laughs> so the stuff we do in I'm building. I'm trying to think of a good answer. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'll give you mine, and you can. Uh, yeah. Tell I mean, me. it, okay. So listen, I, we've both been very blessed. We both sold mm -hmm. the company. You sold probably made a little more money than I did, but a lot more. But we are part of the one percent. Those people are protesting. They're upset at the one percent. Maybe we're that's the three percent of the fourth argument because the one percent is three fifty annual. No, it's not. Yes, it is. No, no, uh, no, no, no. Pull up my. Give me, give me two minutes. All and right, we'll you pull, pull up my up, Anyway, so anyway, if you let's so, just say we're part of the. So top. as entrepreneurs, the stuff we do is this. This stuff is hard, right? Most of these fail. So there's a huge risk premium that needs to go into uh -huh. you know the, the the people who make a lot of money. Very few of them actually do, right? But um, I think Silicon Valley is very similar to Hollywood in that you've got Brad Pitt and Tom Cruise and Julie Roberts making a ton of money, and there's a dream that me as a, as a young entrepreneur can get there too. Silicon Valley has Zuckerberg and Larry and Sergey and people like that. that we people need look that up dream. To. We, we absolutely do. Both Hollywood and Silicon Valley needs that dream. The reality, though, a lot of people waiting tables in Hollywood yeah. and a lot of entrepreneurs that never make it. So those who do are are rewarded, but we work our butts off. We take yeah. a lot of risks. And, and you've created probably hundreds, if not thousands, of jobs in your career yes. over the last 20 years. Yes. So we're going to be upset at you? That's what I don't understand. It's like we're upset well, at I, I think there's a lot of um, people upset over a lot of the loopholes and tax breaks that people... Yeah. I, I don't take advantage of those. I, I need to get a yeah. tax guy or something because I, I oh, don't you haven't put all your stock in Branch out in the Cayman Islands to try and screw America? <laughs> And then you have credit cards that came from the Cayman Islands to pay all your bills. That's not me. No, me either. So, so I actually, these people doing I that? don't feel guilty because I don't have all those tax, or I don't take advantage of them. Hmm. I've paid. I've I've been very fortunate to make some you money. You paid and I've millions paid of dollars in, in taxes. Yeah. So am I. Yeah. God. It's a lot of money, so I don't I'm feel. Just, you know, I'm. Gonna, uh, we're, anybody who's an entrepreneur has done well as a proud American. We we love the system. Yeah. And it it seems like, at least they haven't. Directed the op I think the Occupy Wall Street folks have not directed it at entrepreneurs. They've directed it at corporate. the bankers and the corporate yep, people. That's right. Well, did they have anything to blame? Is there any reason to blame the bankers and Wall Street in your mind? They were. What could they have done better? They were hedge fund managers making a lot of money, mm -hmm. and that was really disproportionate dis um, to others. Right. That and undeservedly so. Yeah, and, and taking bigger risks than they probably should have with someone Ten. else's money. Ten to one leverage. That, that, that was the issue. Is that the, the the risks that we take? I mean, I self-funded Superfan, my second company. Yeah. Right. That was my my own capital going in, taking yeah. risks on my own money. And now I've got, you know, like I said, we raised twenty four million. That's a lot of money. But I've got Kevin Effersey and Jeff Yang from Excel and Redpoint in every board meeting, yeah. making sure I'm a good steward. Oh, they're of their, watching. Yeah, of their money. Yeah. So, um, so I'm and not. That money represents one, two, three percentage points of retirement funds, and it's returned twenty percent per year, year after year, mm -hmm. in the history of venture capital, or yeah. fifteen percent. Or whatever it is. Yeah. So I mean, yeah. Pull it up. You pulled it up. Yeah. Okay. Let's see. There it is. Oh, there we go. So household incomes. Mm hmm Income range. Mm hmm Percent and percentile. Ah. So if you make two thousand five hundred a year, you're in the top. Uh, you're in the low two percent. Okay. So as we scroll down here, you get to the average of the fifty percent. Okay. Or, or sorry, here it is. The fifty percent, which is the national mean, is forty-four thousand. For a household. For a household. Right. So that's two people, usually. Right. So scrolling on down, as we get to the 99 percentile, 250. Where's 99? 98 point, well, you can't see it on your screen. Look at that one over there. Oh. 98.5. Uh, highlight that. I can't see what you're talking about. This bottom row right here. Oh, I see. 250 oh, wow. and above. 
Right. So yeah. So what is the one percent though? It's probably a million and above. No, three fifty takes you to ninety nine percent. Oh, okay. It does say it's two two thousand five data though, so it's a little. It hasn't changed. It, older. I, the, All right. So the whatever. Double 350 it. Three fifty was last year. Three fifty was ninety nine percent. So it's uh, even the one percent is, I mean, it's a lot of money. Let's it's, face it, but it's not. My point is they they made a. Listen, there's a there's a thousand developers at, you know, Google and mm -hmm. making a hundred fifty two hundred fifty thousand a year. Sure. That's their top bonuses. two percent. Yeah. And we need more. And we need more. So the solution is there. If people will just go learn to code. Yeah. And, and do you believe anybody you know, who's 15, 20 years old could learn to code or learn to design? I don't know that, it, um, I don't know that anyone could learn to code. I've never right. learned to code. I'm actually right. on the business side, not on right. the tech side. What about the front end stuff and the um, design? Front end UX? stuff is sure. a bit, yeah. It, it, everyone's got too. some kind of skill that, that they could put their energy into that would be useful. Um, whether it's design or tech or whatever. Is this younger generation or some portion of it not inclined to work hard and not, does it want employment as much as say Gen Xers like us did or baby boomers did? It seems like some of them want experiences in life. Mm -hmm. They want to go on safari or save the people in yeah. X impoverished country. I, I just mean, read an article that said that, that they'd rather, and this is a mass generalization of, well, of the course, entire generation. Well, of course, that's why I said a portion. Right. Right. So, um, yeah, that they'd rather live at home and be able to work flexible hours and go travel and do all that kind of stuff. These guys are smart. I'm starting to think maybe I'm an idiot. Maybe I've, we work too hard. I, I work till midnight most nights, and like, I never, I, I probably should, gave up a ton I'm that they're going to do. I'm moving my mom. I would have... I know. I'm going to move in my mom. We should move in with our moms, <laughs> give up our companies, and we'll do like, we could probably make a site that would take 10 hours a week. We work one day a week, and then me and you could go like surfing seven, six days go, a week. Yeah, go play poker, play surf. Play poker, yeah. surf, hang sure. out with our families. Well, t Tim will tell you we only need four hours, right? Tim Ferriss. Yeah. God, I blame, Tim, I blame Tim Ferriss for all this. I think that <laughs> Occupy Wall, this is the message for Occupy Wall Street. Tim Ferriss is the enemy. You guys should be burning him and everything. I'm joking. I'd love Tim, Tim is my Ferris. buddy and Tim's advisor my boy to too. Branch out, Tim so, is yeah. great. I think Tim is selling, I mean, listen, it is possible to survive on four hours. And I think what he's selling is there's more to life than just work. Mm -hmm. But then you look at Steve Jobs and he's selling, if you find what it is you love in life, then you can pour your whole heart into it. It doesn't feel like work. Right. So be, there are two options. One is you could decide uh, my, what I'm passionate about does not work as a career, therefore I'll do four hours of work a week. Yeah. That's one route. That's if you can't find something that you can productize or build into a business. But I believe anything can be productized and built into a business with very rare exception. Yeah, sure. I mean, the, the ultimate situation is if you do what you love, you're right. passionate about it, and you mm -hmm. make enough money at it. Whatever enough money is for you. If you can mm -hmm. marry those two things, yeah. you've, you've got the, the perfect situation. Let's play guess the fake startup. You want to do this, Karen? I'm ready, are you? Okay, let's do it real quick. Okay. He, okay, so, so now you know the rules? I don't. Okay, this is a segment on the show. This okay. is very, Rick, you understand, it's a highly produced pr you know, show. There's <laughs> um, producers, there's lights, yeah. this is the big leagues. This is real. This is real, it's like real television. I mean, without mm -hmm. the money. And, and the, the live fame. audience back there. And the live audience, we'll have a live audience in this space, actually. Uh, okay, so, she's going to read three companies. Okay. We're gonna listen attentively. You cannot look at the chat room, please take cover the chat room, because that, that's how Tyler cheats. No cheating, Tyler. <laughs> I know what Tyler does, he's looking at the chat room. I'm, I'm Laptops down, one. no cheating. Karen, the managing editor of the launch newsletter and email and everything, is going to read three companies. That's and right. We are going to guess the fake startup. That's right. All right. You guys are Two ready. Two of these are real and one is fake. Yes. Okay. okay. And the real ones come from AngelList. So they oh, are real. Oh, that's interesting. Yes. Okay, let's go. Okay. So the first one is fantasyshopper.com. Fantasyshopper.com. Yes. Fantasy Shopper is a social shopping game. Hmm. Browse and share real world items that you like, then buy them using fantasy dollars. We believe we can make social gaming relevant by incorporating real world data to provide our users with real world value. Hmm. Okay. Okay, Fantasy Shopper. That's number one. Mm -hmm. Number two is beauty2go.com. Beauty2go is like having a makeup counter with you everywhere you go. Can you spell beauty2go for me? Beauty, B E A U T Y. T O okay, G O. It's not the number two. Not the number two. No, it's T O. Beauty to Go is like having a makeup counter with you everywhere you go. Choose your favorite makeup, then set automatic refill triggers so you never have to go without it. Share your new makeup finds with your friends and earn reward points to spend on more of what you love. Okay, it's it's digital makeup, fake makeup. No, it's real makeup, but you set triggers to have it reorder when you run out. 
Oh, kind of like see. man packs for chicks. I got it. Okay, good. Okay. Read the last half again. The last half. Mm -hmm. Share your new makeup finds with your friends and earn reward points to spend on more of what you love. Okay, okay. good. Yeah. Okay. Number three is dogvacay.com. That's D O G V A C A Y.com. Hmm. Dog Vacay is like Airbnb for dogs. It's a community marketplace for home dog boarding. No longer will your puppy be stuck in a cage at the local kennel. With dogvacay.com, you can find a real home for your dog to stay while you're away, or sign up to host a dog and make extra money hanging out with man's best friend. All right. So, Rick, you're new. We'll let you go first. All right. First one was Fantasy Shopper. Mm-hmm. Uh, <clears throat> Fantasy Shopper, essentially... Social shopping. Social game. shopping done right. You earn points. Right. That you can then redeem for goods. Yep. Beauty to go. Mm -hmm. Man packs for chicks. Get your beauty products and have them auto reset and send you your new lipstick or eyeshadow or blush, whatever it is, um, at regular intervals, I guess. Or dog vacay. Airbnb for dogs. Your dog will be watched not by an impersonal kennel, but right. by a loving, caring human with a That's reputation right. for taking care of these folks. That's right. Which do you think is... The fake. And you walk us through your process. All right. I'm going to go with a fake beauty to go. Okay. Now tell us your thinking on why that is the fake one. Well, I'll tell you. The, the first one, I like gamification. Fantasy shopper. That one, ga the gamification and shopping are two hot areas. Right. You put them together, you might get funded. Hmm. Okay. Okay. The last one, I have a dog. Yeah. And... I've gone on vacation, and my dog doesn't like the kennel, where if somebody that I trusted could take the dog, okay, I, I can see why that service would work. Right. The beauty to go, I don't know, it sounded like, I mean, it, it was a bad description. And it sound, I thought it was digital makeup, too. So I was like, okay, clearly this is not, mm. not the case. So a bad description to you equals could be the fake. It could be the fake, and I like the other two. The other two business models could actually work. Ah, okay, so that's a good way to do it. And so if they're not being done, someone could. Hmm. Okay. Tyler? Yeah. Would you like to go? What do you want me to no, do? No, you got to write that. We both have to write down. Oh, right, I have to write it down. Okay. <laughs> I have to think about this. Uh, da, 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 da. <laughs> Fantasy shopper, social networking, the beauty to go, replenish your makeup. Dog vacay is a terrible name, but a good concept. Mm -hmm. I'm having a hard time with this one. Carolyn did a better job this week. <laughs> This is very challenging. They're getting harder each week. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Hmm. They're, they're, I could be wrong. They take what you just said and they apply that to the next week. Yeah, it's very difficult mm -hmm. now. Okay. We're three weeks into this game and it's getting harder and harder. Although last week we both slam dunked it. Um, hmm. Now, last week we thought the really good name was the fake. Therefore, hmm. <laughs> Read. Oh, it's so hard! This is a hard one, they stumped me! No cheating, Tyler. Read Fantasy Shopper again. Yeah, me fresh up. Okay. Fantasy Shopper is a social shopping game. Browse and share real world items that you like, then buy them using fantasy dollars. We believe we can make social gaming relevant by incorporating real world data to provide our users with real world value. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, wrote, I wrote mine. You have yours written? Yes. All right. What is yours? I think Beauty to Go is fake. I think Fantasy Shopper is fake. Let me take you through my thinking. Go ahead. Before you tell us anything. Okay. I think Dog Vacay is a bad name with a great concept, therefore probably real. Because mm -hmm. people will go with a great concept, invest in it, and then they, they'll get a better domain. There's a chance that they put a bad domain name in here with two good ones to throw us off. Mm-hmm. So I almost picked Dog Vacay. That was my second choice. But I'm going to go with Fantasy Shopper because I thought it was so well written that Carolyn would have been the one to write that mm -hmm. because it's just so well written. Beauty to Go, I think that people are very much into this reordering of stuff and there's just so many of these startups that I could see it existing. Um, and that's an, obtainable, both of those, that's an obtainable domain name. So I just felt like fan, uh, Fantasy Shopper, to me, wasn't going to work was a bad idea actually because I just don't like social shopping I just don't think it works and I don't know if the gamification makes it better I don't think people want want to score virtual points to buy real things it's, it just seems weird it's it's just too weird to be good mm -hmm. uh, so what did you pick show me the pay out of piece of paper beauty to go I picked this fake okay so what is the, who's the winner here 
Please don't say Tyler. Don't <laughs> the say fake Tyler. startup is Please. Beauty to Go. Oh! Oh! No! 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 Oh! That's it. I'm out. That's it. I'm not gonna stand for this. Three to one. Oh! Wait, two to one. Three? I have three wins. You have one win. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Fine. All right. Ah, oh, sorry. I didn't mean to right, no problem. That is just ridiculous. <laughs> God damn it. All right, that's the end of the program. I'm so frustrated. <laughs> <laughs> can't believe it. They got me again. You got it. There's, there she's giving. Again, I can't give off the clue. The, 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 what was the clue then? I'm not telling you because you now you I take my clues and you use them to win. The one point you did got because you used my tip from the week before. So I'm not telling. You have to explain. It's like your a poker thinking. tell. There's He's very not subtle hints as to what she's doing. What was it? It's very subtle. I think that this is to put me on tilt and that you're in cahoots with Carolyn. No. We're never playing the game again. That's it. All right, listen. This has been a great program. You've been a great guest. You're Thank very you. honest. You've been very, you gave a lot of good information to the readers. Um, oh, they want, it's another crap everybody wants you to tell. No. <laughs> but that, that ruins the game. You have to explain no, how you no, came, no, no, no. came to the conclusion. No. And you picked Beauty to go too. I did. Oh, this was a terrible interview. <laughs> now that you beat me, a terrible guest. Horrible guest. Now, you were a great guest. Uh, I wish you continued success with Branch Out. Thank you. You guys have really done a great job of building. Uh, and it is a unique product when compared to LinkedIn. Yeah. And it's a much better design product. And that is the benefit of starting from scratch and building in this beautiful ecosystem. It is tremendous. I think you're going to have a huge success on your hands. I mean, it's, it's kind of scary how efficient it is to build this inside the in there. If somebody was a great developer, a UX person, or a salesperson, and they wanted to work for an incredible company like this and get in on the ground floor and get those beautiful, delicious stock options mm -hmm. in the, only in the B round and the second year of the company, I'm guessing they email Rick at Branch? That's right. Rick at Branch Out. Rick at Branch Out.com. Yep. And when, when you hire somebody, what are you looking for? Four things. I like people who are highly intelligent, mm -hmm. who have it's Tyler. integrity. It's Tyler. Who are fun. <laughs> Not so much. <laughs> Keep and going. entrepreneurial. That's tough. If you don't have those four things, you don't work at Branch Out. Really? Yeah. Fun and entrepreneurial. I like that. What yeah. fun? Um, because if you're going to work a bunch of hours That's with right. someone, mm -hmm. and you, want, you want to have some fun with them too. And uh, we have that no, I'm not going to swear because it's a swear jar. We have a no jerk policy. So if you I'm don't fit into those. No, nah, I'm good. Um, <laughs> so if, uh, if, uh, if you don't fit in that You that have criteria, a no a-hole policy. That's what we have. So, um, so and what we think about that is that Great talent begets great talent, right? I mean, so if you build a world-class um, uh, pool of talent, they're going to attract great people and they're not going to leave, right? So that, yeah. that's my, my number one job as CEO is attract world-class talent, take challenges out of their way, let them run as fast as possible. Mm. And when you do that, nobody leaves and they bring in great people. Wow. There you have it, folks. This is tangible important information for you to have in your arsenal when you start your company or working at another company. Uh, what a great guest. Thank, Thank you so much for coming in. I've been looking for forward to this for a while. Uh, since we met, I invited you the second I heard about it. I was like, oh, you're the guy from Branch Out? I'm getting slaughtered with that. Anytime I see a product like just coming up over and over and over again, I'm like, get that person on the program. Um, hey, thank you to MailChimp. Uh, for providing a great product that I use every week. And thank you to SurveyMonkey for another great product that I don't actually use every week, but I use it probably every two, three, four weeks to do something. Like maybe I use it 20 times a year. And for the 24 bucks a month, what a deal. 17. 17, 24, I don't know what it is. Anyway, the point is it costs nothing. It's so so affordable and so much power. Use both these products and thank them. Thank you, Kieran, for uh, reading the game. Thank you, Carolyn, uh, for decimating me again. Uh, very entertaining, and... Are you sure you're playing poker Friday? <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> Why? You could start and I'm going to lose money? No. What? Just, I am just, just nothing. Okay, anyway. It's you're concerned about my ability to read? Yes. Uh, don't worry about it. All right. I'm, I'm fully <laughs> intact. Okay, that's okay. not worth I'm okay. playing tonight, as a matter of fact, okay. at Pollock's house. I lost two games in a row there. I can't even want to talk about poker. Um, once you have a kid, your poker game goes... Hmm. And then I'm playing poker. I feel guilty. What am I doing here? I'm a jerk. I'm playing poker. I got a daughter at home. I mean, she's asleep. Yeah. But I feel like I should be above her crib watching her sleep or something like that. That's, I have tremendous guilt. You have guilt. I, I grew up in um, an Italian family with lots uh, of guilt. A lot of guilt. Yeah. I feel guilty about everything. Yeah. I got to go do something to make myself. How do you make yourself feel less guilty? I work a lot and I feel good about working. Yeah, me too. That's yeah. exactly what I do. I need to, you know what I do? Also, winning at poker will make me feel better. That go will. win some money. That I gotta pay for my daughter's education. There you go. On poker winnings. Hey, uh, thank SurveyMonkey and thank MailChimp on Twitter. 
and join twistless.co and we will see you next time on This Week in Startups. Thank you for joining us.